Good morning again, everyone. This time I'd like to welcome our online viewers as well for our service this morning, this first day and Sunday in October, October 1st. Um, our choir anthem this morning um, is going to be All Creatures of Our God and King. If you would like to come forward, I will do our little history behind the hymn today. This is probably going to be our oldest hymn out of the entire year of hymns. This one dates back to the year 1225. So many stories have arisen around St. Francis of Assisi that it's difficult to separate truth from fiction. We know he was born in 1182 in central Italy, the son of a rich merchant. After a scanty education, Francis joined the army and was captured in war. He came to Christ shortly after his release, his release renounced his wealth, and began traveling around the countryside preaching the gospel, living simply, and seeking to make Christ real to everyone that he met. Francis loved nature, and many stories spotlight his interaction with animals. Once, as he hiked through Italy's Spotoleo Valley, he came upon a flock of birds. When they didn't fly away, he decided to preach them a little sermon. My brother and sister birds, he reportedly said, you should praise your creator and always love him. He gave you feathers for clothes, wings to fly, and all other things you need. It is God who made your home thin, pure air. Without sowing or reaping, you receive God's guidance and protection. It is said that the flock then flew off rejoicing. That perspective is reflected in a hymn that St. Francis of Assisi composed just before his death in 1225, called Cantico di Fratri Sola, Song of Brother Son. It exhorts all creation to worship God, the sun and the moon, all the birds, all the clouds, wind and fire, all men of tender heart, all creatures of our God and King. Though it was written in 12, uh, 1225, an English version did not appear until the year 1919, when Reverend William H. Draper decided to use it for a children's worship festival in Leeds, England. But it, is it sound theology to exhort birds and billowing clouds to lift up their voices in praise? Yes. All creatures of our God and King simply restates an older hymn, which is actually Psalm 148, which says, Praise him, sun and moon, and praise him, all you stars of light, you great sea creatures of all the depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind to fulfill his word, mountains and all his hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. Praise the Lord.
Good morning again. Um, I'd like to start with the first reading this, this uh, morning, taken from Psalm chapter 122, or Psalm 122. Um, I have the English Standard Version, which I don't really feel familiar with this one, but I seem to like it, so it's the English Standard Version. Let us go to the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as the city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, as was decreed, decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. There thrones for judgment were set, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, Peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will speak your good. In our New Testament reading this morning, we come from the book of Galatians. And this is chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul, an apostle, sent not by men, or by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. This ends the reading. So I'm going to start a new series today called Turmoil in the Church. Now immediately, it might not be what you think it's about. This sermon, at least not directly, is about the United Methodist Church in 2023. It's about another church a few years ago, back in the 50s and the 60s. When I say the 50s and the 60s, I don't mean the 1950s and 60s, I mean 50 AD, you know, and a place far away from here, but some present day Turkey back then was known as Galatia, the Church of Galatia. And we're going to be looking at this letter from Paul to the Church of Galatians. And, um, you know, so the Galatian church is a church that has problems, okay? Now, you might think, well, this is going to be pretty much of a downer for the next few weeks, I don't know. But wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. There's good stuff in this letter to the Galatians. Think about this. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live with Christ in me. That's good stuff. How about Galatians 3.28? You know that? There is no longer any Jew or Greek, male or female, slave or free, for all are one in Christ Jesus. And of course, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, have the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It has all those things in it. So, um, so, so there's going to be good, and it's, it's not always going to be high, but it's going to help us to just look at ourselves, I think, and perhaps what we need to do as well. Okay, so I'm going to begin by just, and, and the first thing I really want to say is simply this, we're not the first 
first church to have a problem? Churches have always had problems. You know, we tend to have this idea, oh, well, the early church was perfect. The early church wasn't perfect. You know why they weren't perfect? They had people in them. That's why they weren't perfect, right? So, so there's always been problems. Now, I, th I thought I would start by reading you a couple introductions to, well, three of Paul's letters. Um, the first one is the Church of Philippi. He begins this way, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the Gospel from the first day until now, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I think of you. That's a great way to start. What about uh, his letter to the church at Colossae, we call Colossians? It begins this way, Grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, you have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, in the word of the truth, the gospel that has come to you. Just as it is bearing fruit and grown in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it and truly comprehended the grace of God. So again, he says, in our prayers for you, we always thank God for you. That's great. I would that be great that the Apostle Paul say, hey, I, you're doing great. Thank God. <laughs> and then he comes to the church of Galatia. This is how he begins. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, here's the point where he would say, I thank God for you. And he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, thank you, God, for them. He is upset with them. What, what did they do? What did they do that he would be so upset with them? Well, here's, here's in a nutshell what happened. Paul founded these churches, like I said, present-day Turkey in Galatia, right? And um, he told them about Jesus. You have to believe in Jesus, right? You have to believe in Jesus. And um, so they, yep, yeah, we're on board with that. Paul leaves. And these people come in, they're called Judaizers. They come in and say, you know, Paul got it partly right and partly wrong. You know, yeah, you have to believe in Jesus, but hey, you also have to follow all the old Jewish laws and customs. Even if you're a Gentile, you have to follow the Jewish laws and customs. So all you Gentile guys, you've got to get circumcised. Ouch. And you can't eat bacon. Double ouch. You know? What? And this is what they're saying. You might say, yeah, okay, I, I hear you, but what's the big deal? The big deal is because if you feel you have to work, not just believe in Jesus, but you have to work for your salvation, you're diminishing what Christ did on the cross. You're basically saying what Jesus did in the cross was not good enough. That's serious. We know John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever works for him shall not... No, no, wait, it doesn't say whoever works for him, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Right. So, I, I, I want you to know that the church has always had problems. We see it from the very beginning. There's been schisms. There's been the occasion merger and more schisms and, you know, people think differently and 
the church has always had problems. But here's the news. The church will survive. The church will survive, no matter what. The church will survive. Now, when I talk about the church, I'm talking about the church, capital T, capital C, means the whole worldwide church, right? The church will survive. Jesus speaking to Peter, Matthew chapter 16, tells Peter this, I tell you, you are Peter, now I was in his name, his name was Simon, but Jesus renamed him. I tell you that you are Peter on this rock, now there's a play on words that we don't get at all, because in the English it doesn't work at all, but Peter is the Greek for Petros, is the Greek for rock, right? So you see. So, um, I tell you that you are Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. We sang that in one of our songs just, just a little while ago, right? Won't prevail. The church will survive. The church has survived through wars, through famine, through persecution, through corrupt leadership. The church has survived it all and continues to march forward. Well, actually, I think the church continues to limp forward, okay? But it's going forward. And the church is going to survive because the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, Jesus says. So case in point, the church in China. When the communists took over China in 1949, Mao Zedong, and took over China, um, they declared it an atheist country. And yet, the church kept meeting. In 1966, during the Cultural Revolution, they tried to double down, and one of the goals of the Cultural Revolution was to eliminate religion. And they couldn't do it. The church kept needing. Nowadays, China actually claims to have religious freedom. And China says, we protect normal religious activity. <coughs> Of course, the question is, what is normal if they think it's not normal? Like some, in the last few years, a hundred churches have been required to remove their crosses from the outside the church. You know, because apparently that's not normal, right? Um, but I think, I, I suspect, and some of you have better insight than me, but I suspect that China realized we can in the church. So we're going to try to use the church. So what's going on now in China is that there is an official church, an official Protestant strain, I believe a Catholic strain, an Orthodox church, but there's an official church called the Three Self Patriotic Movement. And you're allowed to be Christian in that church. Of course, the government wants their say in how the church is run. So many Christians say, I don't want to be part of that because they're doing this and they're doing that. I'll give you an example in just a second. So, so many churches are saying, we don't want to be a part of that. And they have their own churches illegally, but are willing to worship illegally, be persecuted, the threat, the threat of arrest, and all that to truly worship God. Now, one of the things, this is what uh, I read, was that the, the, the communist government, China, communist government, they have decided it is in their best interest to rewrite the Bible. They are beginning to rewrite the Bible. There is um, one passage uh, that this sort of came to light. Um, John 8. I mean, you know how John 8 begins? The woman called her daughter is brought to Jesus. What should we do with her, you know? And um, Jesus says, the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And um, so they all drop their stones, and then Jesus says, or where are your accusers while well, they're not here? She says, he says, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. 
Well, apparently, from what I read, the first part of that is still the same. Up until the time they all drop their stones and walk away. And then Jesus says to her, where are your accusers? And he says, she says, they're not here. And at that point, the rewrite has Jesus picking up a stone and killing her and saying, I'm not a sin. I am a sinner too. It's like, what? But anyway, so you see why people say, wait, wait a minute, we, we don't need because, and, and actually whenever the government and church get to involved, that's a problem. Another story. But, um, so just this, uh, just this thing, the church continues to move on. Being persecuted continues to move on in China. One researcher that I heard quoted said this, they believe that by 2030, just think about this, six, seven years away, by 2030 there will be more churchgoers, Christian churchgoers in China than in the United States. Wow. Church keeps moving on. They can't, you can't kill the church. They can't kill the church. Um, so, I, I just be encouraged. The church will survive. It has already survived so much, and it will continue to survive. And the church, yeah, maybe live forward, but the church will continue to move forward. But here's the last thing I really want to tell you churches, small c, will not survive. Not all churches will survive. Um, churches will not. So I thought 1995 was an important year for me. It's the year we went to seminary. I really began the process to go into ministry. I also went one of the first times I went to annual conference. So I thought it would be interesting to see how many churches we had at the time of the Central Pennsylvania Annual Conference. How many churches did we have in Central Pennsylvania Annual Conference in 1995? And I counted up 877. 877 churches. So I thought, I wonder how many churches there are now. Now, I couldn't really do now because it wouldn't be fair because we had this big wave of disaffiliations, right? So, so I did 2022, and that's the latest numbers we have anyways. I excluded Scranton Wilkesboro District because in 1995 they were not part of our conference. So to get the same geographical area, I had to exclude Grand Wilkesburg District. So I counted up all the churches in 2022 in um, the Susquehanna Conference minus Grand Wilkesburg, and the number was 686. In other words, in those not quite 30 years, we lost 191 churches. Some merged with other churches. Some just closed. They just were not viable anymore. Um, you know, um, and, and viable, you know, unfortunately in the world we live, viable means they don't have the money to do what they need to do because they don't have the membership to do, to do that. Um, and I think about, whenever I go through, and, and this makes me think of Becky too, I think about Man in the Hill Church. She grew up, right, in Man in the Hill Church. Still sitting out there Route 39 on Jonestown Road. It's still sitting there, empty. And uh, in bad repair, right, in bad need of repair. And, and, uh, and for some reason I get worried about the bell and the bell tower. I'm like, is that gonna hold? I mean, nobody's, you know, but anyways, if you know. Not all churches will survive. That's not the guarantee, right? And uh, many have not. And you know, a lot of those churches, I'm not, they're not bad people in their churches. There's good Christians in those churches. Some of it, I think, sometimes maybe churches just run their course just like human beings. We run our course, you know, we have birth and life and death, and churches do too. Some of those churches work really hard to stay open. And maybe that's the problem. Sometimes if churches are not careful, the churches will work really hard 
when we need God to work really hard for our churches. Right? In other words, what I want to suggest to you is that you pray for the Holy Spirit to move and work in our church, not just St. John's, but all our churches. Invite the Holy Spirit to come into this church and to move so that we'll just follow along with what God's doing. Right? Um, so we'll just follow along with that. So those sorts of things is what I think. Now no, that we're not the church for first church to have a problem, be encouraged. The church, capital T, capital C, will survive. But not all churches will survive. But still, invite the Holy Spirit. Invite the Holy Spirit to come. Um, over the next couple weeks, we'll be talking in a little more detail what was going on church and uh, in Galatia, but for right now, we're just going to take one minute, take just one minute to consider what the Holy Spirit may be speaking to you about it. It was a signifier indeed of the fact that what Christ did for his church, for you, what he did for you, and certainly may we receive it in that way. It's a great sacrifice for us. We begin with the invitation, Christ our Lord invites to his table, all who love him. Warn us to repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. 
We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Hear the good news Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. So with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. It was on the night in which he gave himself up for us that he took the bread, he gave thanks to you, Father, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and he said, take it. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. Again, he gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this all of you, for this cup is my blood of the new covenant. Pour out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ is died, Christ, Christ, Christ is risen, risen Christ is Lord of So pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other. And one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, on glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The table is set. It has been prepared. Um, Today we'll be serving in the pews, so uh, the, the trays will be brought, brought around. Just take a piece of the bread and just hold it, because then we'll all commune together. We'll do the same with the cups. Um, just a reminder that um, uh, the cups do stick a little bit, so just try to gently rock them back and forth and pull that out. Um, is the best way to get those out. And then there should be a couple orders in the pews where you can uh, deposit them when we're done. Jesus' table said, it's not St. John's table, it's not United Methodist table, it's the table of Jesus Christ. You're all welcome to come and to receive the goodness. Taste and see the goodness of our Lord. I'll oh, ask the ushers to please come.
can't be lost without you. We, we just, we need you, Lord. We just need you. So many times we just try to do it ourselves. But lead and guide us, lead and guide our church, lead and guide all these churches. That we don't put ourselves up to your power and your strength and your wisdom and your might and your glory. That we open ourselves up and just allow you to transform us, to change us, and to change this church. Help our church continue to move forward. Yeah, every once in a while we might get a limp. Sometimes we're going to run it. So we look forward to running for you, Lord. Praise be to God. How that children said.